Some fascinating insights into Jacob 5 and the olive tree allegory from a horticulture perspective with my good friend Jake Taylor in this interview. Now make sure that you subscribe on YouTube, hit the bell so that you are notified of new videos when they come out and go to quickmedia.com. That's C-W-I-C media.com. And at the top there, you can register for our free weekly newsletter, Quick Week. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we bring on my friend Jake Taylor, who is going to talk to us about the horticultural point of view of Jacob Five and the allegory of the tame and wild olive trees. Jake, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Greg. It's my pleasure to be here. So tell us first a little bit about your background and 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 how you came to some of the insights that you have in Jacob 5. Yeah, absolutely. So I went to BYU. I studied genetics, specifically plant genetics. And over the course of my undergraduate and then later at my job at Clemson University, I was working with um, sort of field crops, but in a very interesting way, instead of just agronomic stuff, like how much fertilizer to use, when and how to water, all that kind of stuff, we were doing genetic and biochemical tests for disease resistance. That's what a lot of the stuff that I did in undergrad revolved around was, especially with the trees that I worked on, it was disease resistance. So um, after time at BYU, I did some work for the USDA at their apple orchard in New York. And then I also, like I said, worked at Clemson University uh, at their peach breeding orchard for a couple of years before now in a big diversion, moving to Savannah, Georgia. And I now go to Ralston College, which is the School of Humanities. So that's been a big diversion. And maybe we can talk a bit about that later. But but that's kind of my background is, is plant genetics and horticulture, specifically orchard crops. And so when I was reading the Book of Mormon the whole way through again, this is probably three or four years ago. Um, I was just really struck by Jacob five. And after having learned so much about how orchards are managed, um, I was just blown away. Like this is, this is how we still do it is the way that Jacob five works. This is how orchards are managed uh, specifically under the unique circumstances that the master of the vineyard finds himself in, which is a disease scenario. That, that's what it seems to me to be. This is, this is a disease scenario, a quarantine scenario. We can kind of talk about what that means, what the implications of that are as we go okay. through the text. All right, so this is interesting. Um, how, are we, how do you want to start this off here in Jacob 5 then? If it's all right, let's just take it from the top. I can start reading from verse 1, and I have a couple blocks of, of the chapter itself that I want to read and, and kind of go extemporaneously and, and riff off it a little bit. That's right. Let's do it. Okay. Let us see. So Jacob five, starting with verse one, behold, my brethren, do ye not remember to have read the words of the prophet Zenos, which he spake unto the house of Israel saying, hearken, O ye house of Israel and hear the words of me, a prophet of the Lord. For behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, like unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard, and grew it and waxed old and began to decay. So right off the bat, this concept of a tame olive tree, um, what we would call that now is a domesticated cultivar. Cultivar meaning cultivated variety. So each individual tree that grows from a seed is going to have a unique genetic makeup. No two tree seeds are going to be alike. They might be similar. They're likely going to be very similar, but they won't be exactly the same. And so in nature, this is great because it has that sort of genetic variability so that each individual is a little bit different so that if a disease comes in or like there's a late frost or maybe the seed a bird spits it out somewhere where the soil isn't very good or it's like wetter than normal. It's all these little things. The genetic variation helps that plant species to survive and adapt through time. But when you're growing food, well, when you're growing crops for food, 
you want things to be uniform. You want the fruit to be predictable. You want it to be usually large. And if, if for a peach, we, you know, we are growing peaches at Clemson, you want it to be moderate size, but not too big. And you want the color to be good. And you want it to be sweet and acidic, but not too acidic all these things that you're looking for and you want it to be above all consistent flowering at a similar time every year. All the trees are flowering at the same time, setting fruit at the same time so that when you're running the orchard, you can plan when each section of the acreage will need different treatments and when it'll be harvested and you can have a continuous harvest, mm -hmm. your labor is more efficient. All these things come into play when you're deciding which cultivars, which individual lines of that tame tree to plant at scale. So the way that you find, originally find in the wild these trees is you would go out into the woods and you find a peach or an olive or an apple or whatever and taste it. Hmm, that's really bitter. That's not good. Oh, these olives are really small. That's not good. Oh, interesting. This one has really big fruit and quite a lot of it. And the oil is good or the, for the peach is sweet. You dig it up and you take it back to your farm and you plant it. And like, there it is. There is ground zero population number one of that original tame domesticated variety that you will eventually, hopefully expand out and, and turn into a cultivar and grow at scale. So that's what's going on here is at least just sort of culturally speaking, um, the master of vineyard finds something with the traits that he's looking for, an olive tree that is consistent and good, high quality fruit. Um, and he brings it back to his farm. Will the, will, the, will the orchard then all be from that original tree? Yeah, eventually. So that's actually this whole sequence is about that very process of spreading out that original genetic material but then also the problems that can come from that. Namely, when you have everything grafted um, from the original tree, you, you run into the problems of a lack of diversity. So now everything is consistent and you're getting the fruit that you want. But if there's a particular disease that attacks that original domesticated tame tree, the whole orchard is at risk because whatever susceptibility in that original tree made it so that that disease could get in there and wreak havoc, it's going to be on every single one of those other clones that you have just grafted across the acreage of your orchard. So with that in mind, verse four, and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth and he saw that his olive tree began to decay. And he said, I will prune it and dig about it and nourish it, that it perhaps may short, uh, shoot forth young and tender branches and it perish not. So there's actually a couple things to talk about here. One is the, um, the decay, which I think I'll put that aside until we get down a little bit further. And then there's the pruning and the digging, so fertilizing, nourishing it, putting dung down because animal waste is high and all the things that plants love and need. Um, so this concept of pruning is, is very interesting because you really need young branches to produce fruit. And more than that, you need to stress the tree a little bit to get it to produce fruit, sometimes at all. Because naturally, a tree is gonna wanna get as big and bushy and green as it can um, so that it can survive whatever comes at it. You know, it, It's gonna maximize its available air space, sun space for foliage, because that's what strengthens the tree. As an orchardman, you, you kind of don't want that. You want it to be at a manageable size where people can actually reach the fruit. It's not so tall, it's unmanageable. But also when you clip branches off of a tree and you prune it, it sort of signals to the tree as if it was being eaten. It's like as if a deer or a, I don't know, whatever animal would be eating these types of trees, wherever their natural habitat is. And it's thinking, oh, I'm getting attacked. I'm getting eaten. I need to make sure that my lineage will survive. Obviously trees aren't thinking necessarily in that way, but that's the, that's the chemical response is it, is it pushes fruit. 
So that, well, that kind of, I mean, we can, we can, you, can, you can even apply that to each of us individually, right? There's the, there's the talk mm -hmm. on the current bush as well. Absolutely. It's like, okay, we have to be pruned and, yeah, and, and otherwise there's nothing we're static, right? We're, and, and idleness is, is not a good thing. And so yeah. stre being stressed is not something that is bad necessarily. And having opposition is not bad. It's necessary for us to grow. And then, of course, what we're going to see with Jacob here, or, or Zenus really, is a people are the same way. A nation, a tribe, a church, same thing as applies to an individual. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, at school, some friends and I have been talking about this this whole concept of taking time away from, um, I don't know, real life, but, but like a career, to, to go to something like graduate school and proverbially speaking, spreading out your branches, absorbing more, prolonging that time where you're absorbing more information and hopefully wisdom, um, but that it can't stay like that forever. And this sort of stereotype of the academic who's in the ivory tower and so removed from society, um, like we don't want that to happen to us. We want to make sure that each of us, you know, these friends, we're all at grad school together. We want to be making sure that we're producing and, and I think that comes from being in the world and getting hacked up a little bit um, and the wisdom that comes from that and not just saying, oh, I'm going to take time away and, and retreat from the world and learn all this stuff. We have to go out into the world and act as well for that growth. Let's go to verse five. And it came to pass that he pruned it and digged about it and nourished it according to his word. And it came to pass that after many days, it began to put forth somewhat a little young and tender branches. But behold, the main top thereof began to perish. So this right here, when I read the Book of Mormon again a couple years ago, this is really what stood out to me. Is, is I read that and I said, wait a minute, that's crown decay. That is, it's crown decline where the, if the very top region of the tree is dying, it's a very serious symptom. Uh, it's a non-specific symptom in that you can't immediately tell what is going wrong, but it's serious in the sense that this tree will die. Like this is not, not good. I mean, this is like, this is heart palpitations for a tree. Something serious is going on with this tree. If the very top crown of it has started to decay like that. Um, so really, what this means usually is that there's something attacking the roots. That could be worms, nematodes, it could be a fungus, it could be, could be a virus, any number of things. But something is stopping water and nutrients from flowing up through the roots and towards the top branches of the tree. Um, and there's just so many interesting implications that come out of that that concept of the roots dying out and thus the top of the tree is showing these symptoms. Hmm. Um, and I think, I think they'll unfold a little bit more as we keep reading. Okay. I, I love the idea that you're bringing up here about a disease, mm -hmm. right? Because obviously there's spiritual diseases also yeah, that absolutely. eventually crown decay can happen within Again, a nation, a people, a church, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I love this sort of, I don't know, for me, this, I love Jacob 5 because I see it as a horticulturalist. Like this is, this is it. This is how it works. And then applying it to your own life, just like you said, the, the spiritual diseases that can work in at each of our roots and at the roots of our ward, the roots of our state, the roots of our region our whole church and and keeping an eye out for them keeping an eye out for the symptoms that are really a sign of something deeper and mm -hmm. how can we treat that so let's see how the master of the vineyard treats it with uh with verse seven let's see what happens and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard saw it and he said unto his servant it grieveth me that i should lose this tree wherefore go and pluck the branches from a wild olive tree and bring them hither unto me and we will pluck off those main branches which are beginning to wither away, and we will cast them into the fire that they may be burned. So two main things going on here. We have the grafting of the wild material onto the original domesticated tree. And we have the thought that you have to burn the stuff from the infected tree. 
So let's start first with grafting. So like we were saying earlier, when you have a cultivated variety, a tree that you know what's happening with this tree, consistent, good quality fruit, we like this one. What you can do to propagate it, because you can't do it by seed. Each individual seed is gonna be genetically unique. You're not gonna get the same tree that you started with if you sprout it from seed. It has to be somehow cloned. So typically what you do in an orchard setting is you take young wood, these sort of young tender branches that it shot up earlier in the allegory and you slice off we, we would do just a, a single bud but you can do more than that you can do sort of like a, a sticks worth or whatever and you you fuse it into an existing tree how do you do that so the the amount of a tree that's actually alive is very small most of the tree is what used to be alive but is now dead so all the wood on the inside that's I mean, some trees use it for water storage, but for the most part, it's just dead. It's just structuring this tree, mm. but it's not actually alive. The, that's why you can get these really old trees that are completely hollow, and yet they look perfectly fine because the part that's still alive is, it's just called the cambium. It's just that outer layer. Like when you peel back bark enough and you get to mm -hmm. sort of the green, wet, sticky layer of a tree, that's the only part of the tree that is alive, is that outer layer as it stretches up into the leaves and then down into the roots. So if you take a sharp knife and you slice a little groove, there's different techniques that, that you can do this, but it, you just almost like a surgeon, just make a little slice here, make a little slice there, peel back the flaps of that cambium that's alive, and you slide in the bud or the stick and wrap it with, you know, they're probably using twine, uh, leather twine or, or flax twine back in that time period. Um, we use tape. And mm -hmm. then you just let it heal. And as long as it's, you know, the same species and there's no disease that enters in the graft union, which is where you're putting in the bud, it will just fuse into the tree. It's as if it becomes a part of the tree, even though they're two genetically separate individuals but you can see the difference right you can see you can. oh this is the this is the wild graph that is in here and now it's sprouted out to this and it, maybe it's a slightly different color or i don't know maybe the leaves are slightly different correct yeah absolutely okay. absolutely i mean sometimes it can be hard and sometimes you have to know what you're looking for there's usually these, it's, it's called it's called the graft union or, or grafting scar it, it looks like a scar on the tree. It's usually towards the base. And if you know what you're looking for, you can see it. Oh, there it is. It must have been where they, they hmm. grafted it on. Um, but really where you can tell is if you get the root stock, which is the, the root that you're grafting onto, if that root stock starts pushing all kinds of branches, then you can really see, oh, wow, these are two different things going on here. Hmm. Uh, I actually have a quick story about that, that that I thought was really interesting. Um, during COVID, my wife and I went and lived with my parents just because, you know, it was COVID. We wanted to be around somebody. We didn't want to be trapped alone in our mm -hmm. apartment. So we wanted to be with family. And my parents, they live in California and they had an orange tree at their backyard uh, at the time at the house they were living in. And there were a few of them, like a clementine, there's a lemon tree, all these things. And then there was this one that was just this massive, thorny mess of a tree. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen citrus thorns, but they mm -hmm. are huge, like the yes. length of your finger. They're just mm -hmm. nasty. And um, I was really confused by it. I thought, I mean, someone must have just planted a seed here and got really unlucky because this thing is just a beast. And the fruit was nasty and it was mostly pith. and um, but I had an idea. I wonder if this thing was originally a good tree that got taken over and I sort of pulled the branches back and there it was, there was the graft union and there was mm. this tiny little atrophied clementine tree with like two fruit on it, just engulfed in this sea of nasty thorny citrus. Mm. So I took the saw and the clippers and pruned it back and there it was. It was back, back to its originally intended state of being an orange tree. But it was a really good lesson that you have to continually prune the rootstock, especially 
for the first while while the graft is taking, because as much as the the scion, the, the stuff you want and the rootstock will fuse, it takes time and the rootstock doesn't like it. It knows that it's different. It knows that it's not the same tree. And so it'll try and push gra um, wild material, so to speak, that wild olive tree that's talking about here being used as a rootstock. It'll go nuts and try and overtake the, the science. It does it takes a lot of work, consistent hmm. work over many years to keep that rootstock from overtaking the stuff you want. Interesting. I think it's cool at least. I'm I'm a plant. Um, let's see, was it verse eight? Got a bit of a yeah. tangent. Oh yeah, burning stuff. Hmm. Gotta talk about burning stuff. So when you're pruning a diseased tree, you can't just let the branches lie around in the in the dirt. Because if it's whatever is going on there, whether it's a virus or a fungus or whatever, you, you got to clear it out. You don't want it to just hang out in the orchard and spread everywhere. So when it talks about in, uh, in verse 7 being burned with fire, um, that's trying in whatever way possible to eliminate the disease. Whatever this disease is that is causing this tree to die from the top down, it has to be at the very least quarantined if not eliminated entirely um so that's that's what's going on with the fire and we you know still do this today in in orchards we would do virus trials at clemson for for viruses that infect peach disease or peach trees my parties and specifically those blocks you have to take them like a mile down the road and then burn them because mm. it's just really a really big potential site for contamination you got to get it out well, I wonder if that has any kind of a parallel, you know, to the terms of, you know, throughout the scriptures anyway, of, of, a, of a description of hell, for example, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I, I don't know. It's just kind of interesting that, again, they're, they're all being burnt. <laughs> and, yeah, and, no, uh, it totally is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, there's so much, so much cool stuff going on with the imagery of fire. The fire is now, alive. which which branches are actually going to be pulled? Are they pulling from the top, where because it says main branches here? Are they pulling mm -hmm. from the top where that crown decay is happening? Yeah, actually, if it's okay, let me pull up a picture of an olive tree. Okay, and I can kind of show you um, what what's going on here, more or less. Let me go ahead and get this going. So this is just a random website that I found. But you can see here, this is a really old olive tree. Mm. And the way that God, olive trunk is huge. Pruned, I know. It, this thing's probably a thousand plus years old. Olive trees can live to be really, really, really old. So the way that olives in particular are pruned is that you have this sort of central trunk, the really old mother trunk. And then you have these leaders that come out at different angles. And mm -hmm. as the tree continues to age more and more, you periodically have to remove those entirely because they just get too old. And you want to keep getting those young and tender branches to produce more olives because the mother trunk is good, the roots are good, but you have to clear away the, um, the aging leaders and make way for new ones. So that to me seems to be what's going on when it's talking about removing the main branches is um, this tree is dying from the top down, we just got to clip it back, get it down to the mother trunk. And from there, hopefully, we can graft on some wild material that is going to have the vigor and strength it needs to overcome whatever this disease is. So hopefully that picture kind of helps. Now, now I, this is interesting. I've got two beautiful olive trees in my front yard. Oh, nice. But I, the, the fruit is horrible. Mm -hmm. that's that right. wild I didn't fruit plant that's what these. I'm talking about yeah the fruit is poor it's like you said it's really acidic it's it's no good could you I could actually graft something into those then yeah absolutely you could and 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 let and try and prune other things back and uh how far would I need to prune if I was going to do that um well uh, maybe you can show me your trees later <laughs> yeah okay. but but really if you want to do it right, you got to prune it back as far as you reasonably can. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, they're huge. Really, you want they're huge olive trees. Yeah, if they're if they're super big, because because what you can also do um, is just 
sort of take an area of the tree mm. and prune it back and then graft in something that you want. And then just okay. that specific section of the tree will have oh. that variety of olives. And you, and you end up pruning everything else that was old back and getting yeah, the new Yeah, if you really want it to be a production tree, yeah, that's what you'd do. Yeah. You'd prune everything back and, and keep pruning it because it'll push all kinds of growth. But just ironically, when back. you do that, then you're obviously taking advantage. It's not like planting a new tree. You've got this whole root system already in exactly. place. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And that is why the master of the vineyard is so upset that this tree is sick. Because like you said, this is an established tree. This olives take like a decade, potentially more before they're really starting to fruit. And to have this established tree with such good roots and now it's dying, shoot, what do we do? This, mm. this is not a good situation to be in. So, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what's going on. Um, a, a quick, another quick aside about grafting that I think is really cool. Um, like, like I was talking about putting different varieties on the same tree, um, stone fruits are notoriously good for this operation. In fact... Okay. Okay. One more quick aside about grafting and then, and then mm -hmm. I promise we'll move on. <laughs> so this I think is so cool. This is a guy who um, grafted 40 different kinds of stone fruit onto one original rootstock. So stone fruits being almonds and cherries and peaches and plums and apricots, all those kind of things. So if they're, if the tree is genetically similar enough, you can just keep going. This guy did 40. You can technically do more. Um, and each of them is a different, not just variety, but with these a different species. So I just thought that was a really, well, will that, well, I mean, are these going to be, is this going to be good? Is the fruit going to be good? If, if the original variety was good, then yes. And that's, that's actually a really good point about the power of a tame tree is that when you have that bud, you know exactly what you're going to get. You put it on a rootstock here, you put it on a rootstock there. doesn't matter. The, I mean, the environmental conditions obviously are going to influence the tree, but the, the general overall sort of predictable characteristics, they're going to be the same. It's going to be more or less the same fruit. Hmm. So again, that's why the master of the vineyard is not happy that his tame tree is dying because this is the one he's relying on. And he now needs to do some scattering to make sure that that genetic material. Stays oh, that's alive. fascinating. Yeah. Go ahead and go back here. Okay, I am going to keep going, if that's right with you. Let's go. I forget where we were. I think uh, we were in verse 8 next, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's go from verse 8. And behold, saith the Lord of the vineyard, I take away many of these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will. And it mattereth not that if it so be that the root of this tree will perish. I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. Wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches and I will graft them whithersoever I will. So this is where the quarantine aspect of the parable comes in. Mm. So a little bit of recap. We have the tree, found it in the hillside somewhere. We like these olives. These are good olives. Dig up the tree, take it back, plant it in the orchard. Some number of years later, it starts getting sick. It's sick in a way that we don't know what's going on, but it's serious. So in order to preserve that genetic material, that original tree, you want to not only graft it onto something that, you know, another olive tree that'll keep it alive. You want to graft it far away enough so that whatever disease is affecting the mother mm. tree, we hope won't spread to wherever it is that you're, you're putting the material. So, I mean, kind of likening it back to a, a spiritual context. Nephi and his family were grafted way mm. far away from whatever spiritual illness yeah. was afflicting Jerusalem around 600 BC because it had to be that way. Whatever was afflicting Jerusalem, whatever line of thought was damaging the church back then was toxic enough that the Lord felt that it was necessary to say, okay, you guys need to go way far away in order to preserve the truths of the gospel. Yeah, and and the and the toxicity, the virus, whatever is there, I mean, certainly in Jerusalem, was culture. 
and perhaps even belief system. It was. It was definitely a belief system as well. So that's they they the the virus in Jerusalem was a loss of Christ. And uh, so he grafts those that still believe in Christ somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's and of course that goes right along with uh Isaiah 11, 1, right? The stem and the root, etc. That uh, that Isaiah talks about. Yeah, the branch, yeah. horticulture. Yeah, it's cool. It's a it's a forgotten art, I think. Forgotten science. It's it's a hard science people are sleeping on nowadays. Mm. It's so cool. It just opens up a lot of really interesting things, especially when you go back to old texts, because it was. Just, I mean, everyone just knew this stuff. This was just life. Yeah. Um, and now. We don't have to necessarily participate in agriculture to have a nice life. And yeah, so this would have rung very true to the people of Zenus and of Jacob here. Absolutely. This is this is Zenus's version of general authorities making parables and examples out of social media and smartphones and stuff. Like this is the stuff that they were dealing with every day, especially in the Middle East, because all of it is everywhere. Mm -hmm. We went to went to Greece with with our grad school last uh august and, and it's just all is everywhere everywhere is all of the uh, growth let's see here verse nine i'm going to start at verse nine again take thou the branches of the wild olive tree and graft them in in the stead thereof and these which i have plucked off i will cast into the fire and burn them that they may not cumber the ground of my vineyard so i promise it won't be so stop and go soon enough but i do have to mention this the wild material being brought in is a really interesting move. Um, and I say that simply because I've never heard of it being done in a modern context, probably because we don't need to we can just grow more of a different variety. Or we mm-hmm. have so much of the variety that we want, we'll just take it from somewhere else, do a new rootstock, it doesn't matter. But what, what's trying to be done here is um, taking advantage of the symbiotic relationship between the rootstock and the scion. And what I mean by that is if you have a wild tree that's really vigorous, it's putting out a lot of leaf material because you need leaves for the plant to grow. That's where it's getting all its food from is the photosynthesis. Theoretically, you could take that really healthy, vibrant green tree that doesn't have fruit that's very good, but it's really healthy and graft it into the original tame tree where the roots are having a hard time And as that grows and gets really bushy and green and vibrant, it's able to actually push nutrients back down and disease resistance. Sometimes there's like cool biochemical interchanges going on there Mm. and it's able to, to fix whatever's going on in the roots. So yeah. Because previous to now you've been talking about getting a tame tree that you like and grafting it in somewhere where there's a problem. Yeah. Is this the opposite then here, here you're getting a wild graft, and putting into a tame tree that's having a problem. Yeah, the reverse kind of problem. Yeah. Because you're grafting the tame tree, you're mm-hmm. grafting the tame bud onto a wild rootstock because the wild tree makes nasty fruit. Yeah. But the reverse is you're grafting wild buds onto the sick tame tree mm-hmm. to save the roots that are having a hard time yeah. so that then someday when the tree is healthy enough, you can come back in, snip that wild stuff clean off, and then you're, you're good as gold. You're back in business, and you have the, the tame tree back healthy again. So the Gentiles are just kind of being used. <laughs> <laughs> that's very postmodern of you, Greg. Yeah, it's all a power game. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's an interesting dynamic, this whole yeah. thought of like, cultural vigor or or wildness that you need to imbue a sense of wildness and adventure into the, the tame gospel uh, lifestyle. And I don't know, it's, it's really interesting. I I don't think that means like go leave the church and be a crazy person and go do whatever you want, but it is incorporating. hmm, What, what, how would you, how would you describe that, Greg? I know that's something that you talk about, especially with the concept of kind of pushing away teddy bear Jesus and and living Mm -hmm. a fulfilling life. Uh, be more precise for me. Yeah, the, the thought of incorporating wildness uh, into our lives as uh, uh, gospel living good Christian folk. Yeah, I think I think it's opposition. I think it's uh, stagnant. I think it's uh, you're too comfortable. 
and maybe Teddy Bear Jesus, for example, comes in and you're trying to make something that is, you're focused on yourself, you're focused on first world problems, so to speak. Um, you need a little disruption. You need yeah. some disruption. You need something different. You need to change your point of view. You need new, new frontiers. You need new ideas. Uh, because we're always creating. I mean, creation is a never ending process. Um, God is continually creating. He's creating his people. He is, uh, creating worlds. It, it, it just never ends. And that's, and we are a constant creation, right? We, we never end. We never stop creating ourselves. I, I mean, even physically, right? I mean, you go, I don't remember how long it takes, but to take all of your cells, they're gone within some, I don't remember how long it is, but it's not that long. And they're replenished with new cells. Your, your actual physical body it doesn't last that long. It's just constantly recycling itself, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I want to say it's, uh, I, I'm wary quoting statistics because I don't quite remember what they are, but it's <laughs> something like most of the cells in your body have been completely replaced, maybe 95% or something in, in 90 days, like every three months. Yeah, that your sounds body about right. Is almost completely new. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's just incredible. Um, if it's all right, I'm going to keep going here. So let's go to verse... And, and it came to pass that the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did according to the word of the Lord of the vineyard and grafted the branches of the wild olive tree. And the Lord of the vineyard caused it should be digged about and pruned and nourished, saying unto his servant, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. Wherefore, that perhaps I might preserve the roots thereof, that they perish not, that I might preserve them unto myself, I have done this thing. So he is reiterating exactly... Mm -hmm. What we just talked about, bringing the wild stuff back in, in the attempt to get the tree nice and bushy again so that it can save the original root. Um, Wherefore, go thy way, watch the tree and nourish it according to my words. And these will I place in the nethermost part of my vineyard, whithersoever I will, it mattereth not unto thee. And I do it that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree. And also that I may lay up fruit thereof against the season unto myself, for it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. So there it is, touching again on that point of quarantine. It has to get as far away as possible so that disease hopefully doesn't spread. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard went his way and hid the natural branches of the tame olive tree in the nether nethermost parts of the vineyard, some in one and some in another, according to his will and pleasure. And it came to pass that a long time passed away, and the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Come, let us go down into the vineyard, that we may labor in the vineyard. So returning to that concept of olives needing like a decade, if not more, before they're fruiting, these are sort of the metaphorical time skills that we're talking about here is almost like a, like the image that comes to mind is like a crab pot. You put it there and then you wait. Forget mm -hmm. about it. You don't keep tugging on the crab pot. You just let it sit there. And it's the same with these uh, grafts that the Master of Vineyard is, is doing. You have to let it sit. You can't go messing with the graft. You're always tweaking it, pulling, peeling it back. Oh, is it taking? Oh, it's just going gonna, it's gonna to get sick. It's going to not take. So you have to just let it sit. Wait the years that it takes to see what is going on with your own eyes. If the graft is taken and the fruit is good. It's a very wheat and tares sort of um, sort of image there. Yeah. Um, verse 16. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and also the servant went down into the vineyard to labor. And it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, Behold, look here, behold the tree. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard looked and beheld the tree in which the wild olive branches had been grafted. And it had sprung forth and begun to bear fruit. And he beheld that it was good, and the fruit thereof was like unto the natural fruit. So, theoretically, this could happen, that the, the original rootstock is so good that it pushes out good fruit into the wild material. Mm. I have never seen this happen before. This is sort of like the miracle of it all. This is the miracle of the, the allegory here, that um, you could take wild material, and you graft it into the root of the gospel, and here it is putting forth good fruit. So, I mean, to me, that's, hey, the Gentiles, 
yeah. Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. If you're living the gospel life, you're going to be putting forth good fruit. Mm. That seems to be kind of what that's alluding to. But that doesn't necessarily happen in real life, unfortunately. That would be really cool. Um, and then we have verse 18. And he said unto the servant, Behold, the branches of the wild tree have taken hold of the moisture of the root thereof, that the root thereof hath brought forth much strength. And because of the much strength of the root thereof, the wild branches have brought forth tame fruit. Now, if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. And now, behold, I shall lay up much fruit, which the tree thereof hath brought forth, and the fruit thereof I shall lay up against the season unto mine own self. There it is, reiterating that point again. Because the wild material had that leafy vigor that the sick and dying tame roots needed, it was able to resurrect the whole system. The whole tree came back. Hmm. Um, I am going to go ahead and skip because there's a lot of cycles in this allegory. And that's, you know, that's very true to agriculture in general. It's, it's very cyclical. Certain things happen at certain times of the year. You know, you're pruning in the winter and you're thinning in the spring and you're harvesting in late summer. And there's this cycle, repeat, 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 repeat. Um, mm. And you see that in the allegory. And that's part of the reason why it's so long. But I hope that by the end of this little session here, all of you watching will appreciate Jacob 5 and not think, oh, no, this thing is so long and boring. It's not boring. It is definitely not boring. It's very interesting. So with that in mind, um, let's skip down to verse 38. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, let us go down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard and behold, if the natural branches have also brought forth evil fruit. And it came to pass that they went down into the nethermost parts of the vineyard and it came to pass that they beheld that the fruit of the natural branches had become corrupt also. Yea, the first and the second and also the last, and they had all become corrupt. And the wild fruit of the last had overcome that part of the tree which brought forth good fruit, even that the branch had withered away and died. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept and said unto his servant, What could I have done more for my vineyard? Pardon me. Um, so this... Not all grafts take. Sometimes the rootstock is wild enough that it just won't take the graft. And sometimes the graft will take and it's getting so much, I don't know, chemical interference, I guess you could say, or just so much input from the rootstock that it, it's just not. It's as if it wasn't the same. And there are differences uh, in fruit quality depending on what rootstock you graft cultivar onto. Just an example from, from work that we dealt with is um, if you have July Prince, the sort of tried and true South Carolina peach variety that we grew a lot. If you graft that onto guardian rootstock, because rootstocks also have their own sort of varieties that you're growing for. If you're grafting July Prince onto guardian versus July Prince onto Nema Red, which is a different rootstock, that's really good at fighting nematode diseases, the trees will be different. The growth habit is a little different. One is kind of short and squatty. The other one is tall and more branching and the fruit will be slightly smaller, but this one will have a little bit more. It, there is a sort of interplay going on here. So the thought that you graft something into a wild tree and then and the fruit changes so much that it's just nasty. Um, that, I mean, it is, it is kind of possible. And allegorically, it's very interesting, the thought that like it's the seeds that are being cast where the crows eat them up or the, the, um, mm. the, the sun scorches them. It's just, it's not hospitable. It's just not taking. The yeah, I also wonder, you know, I don't know what all of this is. I know that things have been written on this, but, you know, I, I, I think that this is not just a matter of Gentiles in the House of Israel. It's also dispensations. And, and I've seen some people go through and analyze Jacob 5 and say, well, yeah, here's the dispensations where these things actually happen, so that it's not just a matter of the process of the master of the vineyard, but it's actually the time frame of humanity, right? As, as, he's, as he's going, this is a, the story of the gospel and the peoples and, and, until you get to the end. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
I, I've also heard that before, and it's very cool. Jacob Vibe is awesome. Um, I have here verse 51. Let's skip down a little bit. I have two more little passages I want to read before the end. 51, and then another one further down after this. So here we go. And the Lord said, Yea, I will spare it a little longer, for it grieveth me that I should lose the trees of my vineyard. Wherefore, let us take the branches of these which I have planted in the nethermost parts of my vineyard, and let us graft them into the tree from whence they came. And let us pluck from the tree those branches whose fruit is most bitter, and graft in the natural branches of the tree in the stead thereof. And this will I do, that the tree may not perish, that perhaps I may preserve unto myself the roots thereof for mine own purpose. And behold, the roots of the natural branches of the tree which I planted, whithersoever I would, are yet alive. Wherefore, that I may preserve them also for mine own purpose, I will take of the branches of this tree, and I will graft them in unto them. Yea, I will graft in unto them the branches of their mother tree, that I may preserve the roots also unto mine own self, that when they shall be sufficiently strong, perhaps they may bring forth good fruit unto me, and I may yet have glory in the fruit of my vineyard. Definitely a gathering of Israel sort of imagery mm -hmm. coming in here. But horticulturally speaking, the stuff that you grafted, the master of the vineyard grafted all across the whole landscape of his orchard, it's still genetically the same material that it was when he put it out to pasture, so to speak. And that's the really interesting thing about genetics is that they're very stable. They're very fixed. And so if you have something that is the same variety grown in Chile and it's the same variety grown in Washington, genetically they are still the same and they are really fundamentally the same tree so grafting that original material back into the mother tree it's it is it's definitely a coming home sort mm -hmm. of moment where it's united with the mother tree and now it's it's the same it's as if it had never left Interesting. Um, let's go down here to verse 70 and kind of take it home which take one home. 70 yeah verse 70 Okay. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant, and the servant went and did as the Lord had commanded him, and brought other servants, and they were few. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto them, Go to and labor in the vineyard with your might. For behold, this is the last time that I shall nourish my vineyard. For the end is nigh at hand, and the season speedily cometh. And if ye labor with your might with me, ye shall have joy in the fruit which I shall lay up again unto myself, against the time which, which, which soon come. And it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their might, and the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them, and they did obey his commandments, uh, and they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. And there began to be the natural fruit again in the vineyard, and the natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly, and the wild branches began to be plucked off and to be cast away. And they did keep the root and the top thereof equal, according to the strength thereof. So this is a really interesting image. The thought of keeping the branches and the roots in equilibrium. Because what can happen if you have a tree that has too much foliage for the amount of roots strength is you can get what's called cavitation, where the, the way that plants pull water out from the ground, it, it, the, the term is transpiration. So it's essentially almost like it's sweating out of the, the leaves. The underside of the leaves have these pores and water is constantly sweating, wicking out. And because the, the capillaries that the water goes through are so thin, so small, just the act of wicking out water through the leaves is able to pull water from the soil through the tree. That water potential of the water leaving the leaves, just evaporation, just the force of evaporation, teeny, 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 tiny forces we're talking about. And it's able to pull water up from the roots through the, the trunk of the tree and into the branches and the leaves. Hmm. Um, yeah, so, so it's not an active process. It's a passive process. As the wind blows and as the sun shines, the water wicks constantly. There's no stopping it. 
it's constantly wicking, which is a problem for desert plants because if there's no water in the soil, the water keeps wicking. So there's all kinds of interesting ways that plants will prevent the water from wicking away um, in order to hold on to as much water as they can, like cactus mm. and stuff like that. So, But if you have too much leaf and not enough root and the water is constantly wicking, what will happen is it'll actually, it's almost as if it rips the, the, the water stream apart inside of the trunk of the tree. That's that cavitation. It's forming a cavity in that vascular tissue where there's now a gap of air. And because of the, the way that the water is wicked through the leaves, if that, if that bead, that line of water is broken, it can't be fixed. It's just toast. That particular vessel for getting water from the roots to the leaves is now offline. There's no getting it back online. And when that happens to enough of these teeny microscopic xylem vessels, um, the tree will die. It's as if you take a chainsaw and rip around the whole thing and you girdle it. That is essentially what happens when there's too much leaf surface wicking away moisture for the amount of roots in the ground pulling up the water from the soil. Interesting. I have never heard that. Yeah. To me, it's, um, it's very much a sort of don't run faster than you have strength sort of image where if you're putting yourself out too much into the world and you're pulling too much on your internal resources, your spiritual, mental, physical resources, um, like you can take it too far and you can damage yourself. You can damage your relationships. You have to make sure that you're taking time to feed the roots. And you don't want to be all roots and no branches, and you're not making the world a better place where you stand. But it's it's about that balance. It's mm. all about the the tug and pull and the balance between outward works and inward, whatever the roots would be: faith, belief, um, self reflection, taking care of yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I think it's cool. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go ahead and read through the end just to, to finish up. The chapter okay. here. So I'll start with verse 76. Or uh, my apologies, um, 73. And there began to be the natural fruit again in the vineyard, and the natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly. And the wild branches began to be plucked off and to be cast away. And they did keep the root and the top thereof equal according to the strength thereof. And thus they labored with all diligence according to the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard and the Lord had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit. And they became like unto one body and the fruits were equal and the Lord of the vineyard had preserved unto himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. That one body line, that's literally true. The, that's that genetic material. They are literally the same tree. All of those natural tame trees that have been grafted and are now producing good fruit. You know, it brings me back to a couple of phrases in the scriptures. That makes me, you know, again, you don't know how much of this is, I think it's more than we think that these mm -hmm. are, you know, they're pulling from, we don't know what prophets might've been pulling from Zenus. We don't know. Uh, I mean, obviously Jacob's doing this here. And, and I think there's other, you know, uh, uh, quotes from him throughout the book of Mormon, but, you, the one body, you know, you think about the intercessory prayer, for example, and, and, and how that might play into this. And then the other one is the first shall be last and the last shall be first, because that actually is a direct correlation to the Gentiles and the Jews or the house of Israel mm. and, and how they will give the gospel to the others. And the, and then the others will give the gospel back to the house of Israel. Right. And so that is, that is an obvious to me correlation here because we know that's what they're talking about is they talk about, you know, eventually it comes back and now we've got one body again. It's, it's the gospel has been brought out to these other areas. There's a culture, there's a belief system, a, a uh, worldview that is created among them. Um, and obviously part of the branches are, are always going to be corrupt, but eventually what is left after all is pruned uh, is one body. It's it's pretty cool, really. When you look at yeah. it that way, you bring those phrases, 
those scriptural phrases into the into the mix. Yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, the, the all truth being circumscribed into one great whole. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> very, very cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead and finish us out here. Here we go, 75. And it came to pass that when the Lord of the vineyard saw that his fruit was good and that his vineyard was no more corrupt, he called his, up his servants and said unto them, Behold, for this last time we have we nourished my vineyard, and now behold us that I have done according to my will. And I have preserved the natural fruit, that it is good, even like as it was in the beginning. And blessed art thou, for because ye have been diligent in laboring with me in the vineyard, and have kept my commandments, and have brought unto me again the natural fruit, then my vineyard is no more corrupted, and the bad is cast away. Behold, ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. For behold, for a long time will I lay up of the fruit of my vineyard unto mine own self against the season, which speedily cometh. And for the last time have I nourished my vineyard and pruned it and dug about it and dunged it. Wherefore, I will lay up unto mine own self of the fruit for a long time, according to that which I have spoken. And when the time cometh that evil fruit shall again come into my vineyard, then will I cause the good and the bad to be gathered, and the good will I preserve unto myself, and the bad will I cast away into its own place. And then cometh the season and the end, and my vineyard will I cause to be burned with fire. Another cleansing image of fire there. The earth. Yeah, absolutely. I just think it's so interesting, especially in these last few verses, at least to me, how many levels the the allegory is working on at the same time. Because you have the personal level of like the ideas. These, don't, this, is, this is gospel according to Jake. This is not like church doctrine, but, but hear me out. Uh, That's sort of the ideas that you're taking in, the habits that you're taking in and pruning out. And like you are the tree, you are the roots and the branches. But then also it's your community that is the roots and the branches. And instead of the fruit being your works, the fruit is you. You are the fruit of your culture. And if the culture and the church at that time is producing bad fruit, something has to be done to, to correct it. And we have this sort of dual level, individual and community dynamic going on in the symbolism because like, that's just, that's life. It's always both. It's always you're influenced by your environment and you are the nourisher of yourself and those around you. The, the being and becoming nature versus nurture, it's always both. It's always mm -hmm. both and at the same time. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and then of course you look back and you say, okay, well, did Joseph Smith know all of this? You know, was he an orchardman? Did, did, does he understand how this all works? Because he doesn't, right? He doesn't. And here you have 77 verses that are, very intricate and very detailed about how to run an orchard. It, it's, and, and this of course would have been a, I don't know if completely ubiquitous, but it's, it's well known, right? And, and, and there would have been a lot of ref cultural references to this horticulture uh, in their, in their time, not just in the scriptures. And so it's, this to me is, it, it, you're you're bringing the past into the in, into the present here, and and so for us to go back there, become one with them in a sense, and understand this, and what they're trying to say, it's it's pretty cool, you know. It it's it's that book of, the Book of Mormon becomes the bridge between the fathers and the children, so to speak, yeah. and and the prophets of old and 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 us today. Yeah. Absolutely. I've actually been thinking a lot about that, that concept of the, the breakdown of intergenerational wisdom and how it's passed. Um, and, and seeing so many of my peers leaving the church, and it, is, mm -hmm. it breaks my heart because it, it's this tug and pull where it's like, I get the reasons. I understand the qualms. I understand the authority issues with people who go and find crazy stuff in church history and uh, and, I, and I understand where they're coming from and the social issues and how people get really upset about LGBTQ stuff. Like, it's not cut and dried. It's not easy to say, oh, like you're bad because you think X. 
But I just don't, at least for me personally, it just is not a good enough reason. None of them are good enough reasons to just cut yourself off from the tree of the church because the, it's like the reasons are loud, but the costs are hidden and quiet, and, but they're big. They're very big if you cut yourself off from your spiritual roots. Well, and, and for me, you know, I mean, it's not like I, I go along with everything. I have issues here and there with, with things, and um, I struggle with it, and I don't think that's a problem. I think that's part of the process to me. You know, I, 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 I think faith is earned, and, and it's built. It's not just given, you know. It, 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 it's something you have to grow with, and, and it's like any relationship. Faith is a, a relational noun and verb basically. You know, it's how do I build this relationship with God and with the truth? And and how do I react with that from that relationship? And am I grounded in it? I can say, look, there's so many problems here. There's problems there. I don't like this about history. I don't like all these things. But in the end, when I read the scriptures, it's true. It's, it's true. And the other stuff, eventually, it, it look at it, I think, in a proper context, it simply becomes noise. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think that some people lose the signal among that noise sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the Book of Mormon. There it is. You come back to the scriptures and cuts through yeah. the noise. Well, this is really cool, Jake. I really appreciate your input and your experience and knowledge in, in applying this here. There's many things that I had not known about this, uh, and I love how that modern knowledge here is, again, kind of brought back as one with the the ancient knowledge, and I really like the idea. I, I think it's right, right, that uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with disease, and you're dealing with a a, a spiritual disease, and this is how the Lord works. And it's it shows you the participation that we all have in the gospel everywhere, everyone. It, it's it's uh, um, it's charity in a sense. We participate in the love of God. We participate in doing the same thing and in working in God's plan and his work and his glory. It's not an observational thing. And I think much of Christianity looks at it that way. It's like, well, God's out there and we're here and, 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 you know, eventually hopefully we can be back with him, but it's like, wait, you know, it's no, it's, we are part of the orchard. We are part of the ecosystem of God. And, and to pull ourselves out of that is uh, that's not his plan. His plan is that we are in the ecosystem and, and and we participate, and the ecosystem falls apart without us, in a sense. Not that he's going to be gone, but, you know, we're part of the plan. Yeah, so. absolutely. I was talking about this with, with my brother-in-law not long ago, the, the thought that Moses has this sort of uh, theophany vision of the, all creation, and he says, now I know man is nothing, nothingness yeah. of man, and yet it is all for us. And the thought that we are God's children, like, that primary song, I'm a child of God, I think we take that for granted. That is such a powerful phrase. I am a child of God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. All right, Jake. Thanks so much for your time. We'll have to have you back on. Yeah, thank you. It's been such a treat. Thank you so much.